Well, so John, it really is a pleasure not only to have you in Boston again after many, many years, but to have you as our guest at WGBH. But it's a long time since we've seen you here in Boston. It must be, what, 18 years? Well, I, I remember when you played with the New York Philharmonic. That's right. Where you played Purcell, Brahms with with Otto Schnabel, the B-flat concerto, and the Schubert Seven. Is that That's correct? very flattering that you should have such a, a memory of that. Yes. No, that, that concert was a pleasure. And when, we, when I found out that you were coming back to this country, I was hoping very much that you'd be conducting the Boston Symphony for the first time. Well, it's, it's something I've looked forward to for years, and now I'm actually in the throes of doing it. Well, how, how long has it been since you've, since you've been back to America? <laughs> it's, it's exactly 15 years since I left for the last time. But I did go home the year before that, in 1942, during the summer recess, to do a series of benefit concerts in England. And that's quite a story. Would you like me to embark on Was that on it? during the war? During the war. Well, how did you get back? In 1942, that was the height of the <coughs> of the submarine menace. Well, it, uh, the then first Lord of the Admiralty, A.V. Alexander, <coughs> who is now Lord Alexander, the leader of the opposition in the House of Lords, was a very great friend of mine and a very keen musician, amateur, of course, and he used to write me and say, you know, John, we, we miss you terribly because music's flourishing as it's never flourished before. And it would be lovely to have you here. Well, I, I was dying to get home and see my family. So I said, if you can get me over, I'll come with the greatest of pleasure. So apparently he went to see Churchill, who made the remark that he said, well, he says, if you fool enough to want to come, he says, let him come. <laughs> They got me a passage on a little, on a little Norwegian freighter of 3,000 tons. And um, we had a rather perilous passage. It took us 23 days from New York to Liverpool. Well, was it worth it? <laughs> oh, rather. I had a wonderful time. As a matter of fact, when the war was over, Alexander talked to me one day. He said, you know, out of that convoy of 74 ships was left New York, 32 arrived. So the fates must have been kind to me. It was most exciting, and I, I really was very thrilled to be back home at that moment. Well, when did you take over the Halley Orchestra in Madison? That was in the next year, the next 1943. Year. And talk about the Halley. Last year, 1958, we celebrated our centenary, our 100th birthday. The first British orchestra to reach that venerable age, and what rather impressed some of your colleagues I met today when I told them that in a hundred years' history, I'm only the fourth permanent director of the orchestra. Four and a hundred years? <coughs> Halle, the founder, Hans Richter, who conducted the first performances of the Wagner's Ring, Hamilton Hardy, and now me. Well, now you. Well, how much longer do you intend to stay? Ah. Well, as a matter of fact, I, I'm, I'm really curious about something. I mean, uh, you're on leave, on a sabbatical? Yes. Or... That's right. Because, uh, you know, for 15 years, I've practically devoted myself to them. And they've been asking me to come back here for many years now. And having seen them safely to their centenary, I thought the time had come to come and see some of my old friends. You know, time is passing, and I thought otherwise it might be putting rather a premium on longevity, shall we say. <laughs> well, how do you like New York after 15 years? Well, it years? is grand to be back and see. And you know, there's still 32 of my boys left in the orchestra. It's about a third of the orchestra, almost a third. I was, it, it's quite a lot, you know, after that amount of time. And what really touched me very deeply was that was the first morning when I went to rehearsal, Naturally, the 32 were there. But all those who have been pensioned and are still alive all turned up to see me, too. Uh, in other words, a really sentimental <laughs> occasion. And you like that. Ah, oh, it is lovely. Oh. Well, I see in your program tomorrow night you're including 
an arrangement of music from the Fitzwilliam Virginal book. Yeah. Now, I don't know this arrangement, this suite. I remember well your, your suite of Purcell, yeah, which yes. you recorded with the Philharmonic. That's right. Well, this uh, Virginal book arrangement I made many years ago, curious enough, when I was on vacation in Vancouver. And, um, and it bears the date, the 6th of June, 1940. 1940? 40. And I made it, really, because I'm very fond of this music. And it's music that is very little known outside the small circle of people who, who are interested in that it's kind of music. Guard. <laughs> That's right. And so I thought I'd try to make it better known to the general public. And it has proved a, a very great success everywhere on the continent. And I've I, I played it in Philadelphia. I played it in various Washington the other night. And it, it surprises people that there was in the 16th century a school of music, as of, of a rather school of composition, as interesting and original and modern sounding as that, which has full of false relationships. And, uh, and the ports of fifths and has a tremendous vitality and beauty of its own, I think. Well, I, I assume that you're, you, there was no harmony to fill in. It was a question. No, no, that you must not do. That's why they're so difficult to arrange these things, that you can only build contrapuntally if the occasion presents itself, that you can make imitations and things like that. But if you, the moment you thicken it or add any harmonies, you take away that peculiar flavor, shall we say, that that music has. Well, you, you got some fascinating effects in the last movement. <laughs> with, with the cello. Like, uh, with the ponticello yeah. and then the spring bows and things. I, in listening to the rehearsals, I know in the, the Walton, the partita, Yeah. Well, frankly, when the first movement was over, I thought the whole piece was over, and I was terribly surprised that more, uh, music, three, three more, <laughs> more music came along. <laughs> that, I gather, is the first, the first Boston performance, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. it is. Although it was written, I gave the first English performances. It was actually written for this country because it was commissioned by the Cleveland Orchestra. Oh, George South. Yeah. But one thing I, that struck me, and I hope Sir William Walton won't object, but I, 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 f I felt that the, that the first movement was very close to the Johannesburg Festival Overture, which no, I think Lynch that really, has done. I think your saying that is really a compliment to him, that, he, that his music has what Ernest Newman always likes to call the composer's fingerprints. <laughs> well, it has that, but no, no question about that. The, the other two movements are completely new yes, to yes. me. The one thing, though, I must confess I was sorry about, because I know on records, you seem to be very fond of Dvorak. At least yeah. I assume since you've yeah, been well, I, Dvorak, I, I, you are. I, well, I have a soft spot in my heart for Dvorak. And that's not terribly fashionable in this country. No, no. But I was, I was really kind of... In looking. fact, well, I said the whole list of symphonies, you know, to, to the boss, and this is the program they chose out of the... Oh, I see. ...material. I, I sent them a long list of works that I was prepared to do. Are you doing any in this country um, at all? Any Dvorak? I did. The, I did the fourth in, in New York. Oh, I see. But well, that, that was done here about this three season. weeks ago. <laughs> the one I'd like to do here one day is the second, which is, we, uh, uh, they, they, you know, they're all cockeyed. The numbering of those symphonies. Because number one and number, number two six is really number nine or oh, number eight. Yeah. I don't know. Because uh, I think uh, number one becomes number six. Yeah, exactly. As a matter of fact, there isn't even a recording of that anymore. But. Uh, and then, did you know the little third? That's a charming one. Hardly ever plays. I own them all except number five. Right. I have two, three, and four. <laughs> one, two, three, four. Then I'm a snob and I avoid number five. And I have lots of chamber music. Lots of chamber but music. But talking chamber music, I've just, I think it's been released here. I've just done a very rarely heard piece of his for two hours, two flutes, two hours, two clarinets, two bassoons, two horns, and cello and double bass. Well, I, I've only it, read about this. That's I an enchanting piece. Now, I believe that has been... Because I know the string serenade. Yes. No, no, this is for... This is... I am... Uh, double wind quartet, two horns, one cello, one double bass. I think it's been released here. You might have a look, because I think that fascinates you. Isn't it coupled with a, an the, oboe? The Haydn over concerto. And that's with your wife. Well, I don't like them. 
mention these things. <laughs> well, no, as a matter of fact, you, you told me something which, which really came as a surprise in the old, the old Bush recordings. Yes, she, she But the name Rothwell. Well, yes, she's the old Bush. In all the original Brandenburg's, uh, Brandenburg set, and they've reissued those now, I think, in, in long play, and she's rather amused, because she's not a very old lady, to find herself listed now as part of a historical record. In the star <laughs> Well, she flattered. <laughs> well, she, she's young enough to be flattered. That's right. <laughs> well, there's, a, there's a point where she... she and if you've she got any flattered. of the... Uh, at the Glyndebourne Opera recordings, she's in, with, with Fritz Busch, she's in all those. She's in all, oh, I have them. Because she, she was the first over at Glyndebourne. No, actually, I have From the very first I season. every one of those yeah, well, from a long time. As a matter of fact, from a long time ago, I have a recording of Schubert number four with a gentleman by the name of Sir John Barbro, the conductor. Ah, uh, uh, that was with the Philharmonic. With the Philharmonic. A very lovely symphony. It's a wonderful thing being That is hear, sadly right? neglected. And you never, never hear no. that. But the, uh, and that's never come out. You know, sometimes the, the old ones are put out. On yes, the, yes, yes. But that's, that's disappeared. That's a very beautiful piece. Well, now to ask you, ask you a very tactless question. How do you like conducting the Boston Symphony Orchestra? Oh, I don't think it's tactless. I'm having a wonderful time. And uh, I like to think that they're, they're enjoying it, too. At least we're having a, a very pleasant few days of real music making together. You know, I had to I hate to confess this, but going to Symphony Hall for one of the rehearsals, you're talking about chamber music, I thought of the ridiculous idea of the Trout Quintet with Serge Kuzovitsky bass, Sir John Barbarelli cello, uh, Pierre Monteux viola, and Charles Munch violin and Leonard Bernstein piano. There we are. <laughs> Who would live? <laughs> Who might, sold, might have sold a few of those records. <laughs> it would be extraordinary. Well, Sir John, it really has been a pleasure to have you here, and I thank you not only on behalf of WGBH, but I thank you on behalf of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. As our special intermission feature, you have heard a conversation with our guest conductor of two weeks ago, Sir John Barbirolli.